This happened when I was 13 or 14. This was probably one of the last times that I went consistently to see my aunt. She lived very close to a mountain near Oaxaca. Her husband, my uncle, was a pretty wealthy guy. He sold and bred livestock. He had a lot of horses, cattle, goats, and dogs. Their house was a pretty big place with lots of land for the animals. Of course, their house was very isolated. The closest town was quite a ways away. We went there one year to stay with her and everything was normal for the first few days. When the weird things started happening, it was early in the morning. I wear wristwatches and I always take mine off to go to bed and put it back on after I brush my teeth and whatnot. I remember waking up, grabbing my watch and putting it on the top shelf of this shelf outside the bathroom, brushing my teeth and coming back to find it gone. I thought for a second and I looked around the shelf and under it, but I couldn't find it. I went back to the room I was staying in and looked around there and it wasn't there either. I thought maybe one of my siblings was playing with me and I looked around, but all three of my siblings were fast asleep on the floor. That's when I started getting, not scared, but worried. I go to look around the shelf once more and I still can't find it. I remember saying out loud, whoever took my watch, give it back because I'm getting mad. I walk away to put my shoes on and from the living room, I could hear a slight noise. It was my alarm on my watch going off. I peeked my head into the hallway and I could see the blue light from my watch. That's when I got scared. I walked up to it and put it on and got a really uneasy feeling. I go to watch TV and I see my aunt walking into the kitchen. I say good morning and I ask her if she grabbed my watch. She says no, but not to leave valuables in the open. I asked her why and she says, the duendes will take them and hide them. I gave an uncomfortable laugh and said, right. She obviously saw that I thought she was crazy. She told me she was serious and that the duende probably grabbed my watch. In my mind, I'm thinking this lady is nuts. Later on that day, I asked my mom if duendes were real. She gave me a concerned look and asked me why. I told her that my aunt said that there were duendes in the house. She steered away from the question and just said, if you feel scared, just start to pray. I didn't think about it much after that. I remember that we watched a movie in the living room and I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up to a thud coming from the kitchen and footsteps running from the kitchen. The footsteps were light, but still audible kind of like when a cat runs. I see lights turn on from the hallway and I see my aunt running toward the kitchen. I hear her say, Mendingos duendes, which means roughly damn elves. I slowly get up and peek into the kitchen and it's a huge mess. A lot of stuff knocked over, most of it food. I asked if an animal got in, maybe a raccoon. She's so irritated by the mess, she just says, Duendes. I roll my eyes and look at my watch. It was almost 4 a.m. I decided to help her clean up. We finished cleaning up in about 20 minutes, and that's when I helped her with the dustpan. It was one of the sucky ones where you have to crouch over and hold it. When I crouch over, I look to the huge pile of food and I can see either sugar or flour. And that's when I made out little tiny footprints. Not like baby footprints, but smaller, like if a lizard had human feet. I look to my aunt and she says, I know, I saw them, I told you. I'm still not completely convinced, so I go to bed and I wake up and nothing happens for a few days. The last experience I had with these things was when I was sleeping and woke up for some reason or rather no reason at all. I remember feeling uneasy, trying to figure out why I was awake. I could hear those footsteps again as something small was running in front of the bed. 
I sit up fast and I see a small shadow running weird. Like it was kind of waddling, but still moving really fast. All this happened in a matter of seconds. I turn on the lights and nothing is there. I couldn't make the shadow out, but it was small, maybe a foot tall. That's when I started believing in them. I was so uneasy after that, and I was glad I was getting out of there. I may have been a skeptic going into it, but after that visit, I am a believer in Duendes. This happened back on the 27th of December in 2019. I live in the UK, but I'm primarily of Irish heritage on my father's side and my family has been living in the locale for roughly four generations. There's a hill that I had to walk up after work to get to my home from the station. At the top, there are two Victorian lampposts. On the right, a couple of houses alongside the steep embankment, which is a dell with a tarmac understory, and to the left, woodlands, mostly oak and beech. Anyway, at the lamp post closest to me, I could see a figure struggling to climb it. At first, I thought it was a rat. I'm pretty short-sighted, and I wasn't wearing glasses. As I got farther and farther up the hill, it started to look more and more humanoid. I'm in shock at this point, and a bunch of correlations come into my head, and they all rest on fairy. I start laughing hysterically because of it due to the sheer absurdity and I literally shouted something rude at the fairy because I was just in total disbelief. I guess I thought taunting it would prove it or disprove it, I don't know. But two seconds later, this clap-bang explosion goes off at the back of my head and knocks me to the ground. I just start running to get out of there. I had no bumps or injuries on the back of my head, and the sheer force of it is just unexplainable. I honestly would have shrugged off the entire experience if it hadn't been for that. Moral of the story, I suppose, is don't be mean to fairies. I'm still not entirely sure what I saw. I want to tell you a story about my mother's encounter with a doppelganger. It was about nine years ago when my mom was doing a late shift. She was still an accountant at the time, so she had to work extra hours to complete her work. She told me that at about 11.20, she went for a quick coffee when she sighted a person exactly like her that went past by the break room. She thought she was just being paranoid and that her eyes were tired she was scared that it was a thief, though, so she brought her personal bag with her just in case. She went down for the coffee, then came back to the working station. But as she stood at the door of the break room, the doppelganger was standing there right by the computer. My mother was terrified as it just stood there looking at the computer. Luckily, a security officer was doing his last rounds to turn off the electricity and he saw my mom. He touched her, which brought her back to reality. But this time, the officer noticed the doppelganger. He seemed to understand what was going on and proceeded to escort my mom out of the building. When they were outside, he explained to her that it was a bad omen and told her to change where she worked. She did and got a promotion about two months after the incident. She never saw her double again. My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse, and we've had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, and so on. We've had paranormal investigators over to our house, and we're waiting on the report. Last night, I was in the bathtub, 
My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands and went back out to do laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen and saw what he thought was me in the hallway. Apparently, I was buck naked. He called my name and he said that whoever this was turned her face toward him and gave him a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column going the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to. When my husband said he was talking to me, my son said that I wasn't there. He'd never seen me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub and he made me swear up and down that I had never left the tub. He was very freaked out and made us follow him from room to room for the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months prior. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. And also she told me to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. It's easily the weirdest thing we've ever experienced. Does anyone else have a doppelganger story? I've been debating with myself for months whether or not I should tell this story. And today, I finally feel like it's time. I need to tell people about this, and I need someone that knows about this to hear it. I lived in a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell something was wrong. I felt uneasy in there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house and we slept in a wooden storage house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance and in front of it, there was an open empty field with one of those outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house to the left and then the forest. In the forest entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches, meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that here to mark something. And right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something there. I moved there with four dogs. Plus there was the dog that already lived there that we took care of. Our routine was to wake up at 5 a.m. and to go into the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. I stayed up all night and slept on my way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night. I dismissed it as the wind, cliche I know, but it became more frequent and more violent. Then, still in the very first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just had an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything. So I just kept staring at it, trying to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room. It tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed. It started to slightly move things and kept being a general creep. Whenever I flashed a light on it, it disappeared, but the eerie feeling stayed there. 
I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. Eventually, of course, I started falling asleep during the day, and on some days I woke up with headaches and the feeling that my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras, because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through the forest. This is important because of what happened next. Then one day my aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said that the place had gold buried on it for some reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before, and she decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. There's a certain feeling of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned that this day as I dug the hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rocks, I hit something soft and resistant that felt like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. Immediately after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape. I tried to break through it, since my aunt insisted it was protection for the gold, and my parents were just whipping me into helping her, but it was no use, and it occupied most of the area of the hole so we couldn't dig around it. It was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt said then that we should cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room non-stop, and even the flashlight stopped working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything just pressuring me, pressing in on all sides. My door wouldn't close. That thing would make noise, and it would just be there, staring at me. All the security cameras stopped working the moment that it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window, and one that pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage, and all the cameras had stopped working, except for the one pointing to the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, it never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep out of the fear, but it never actually showed up again, and things got calmer. We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about it even now, four years later. It was just too real, and there were things that were noticed by other people too. I especially keep thinking about that thing we hit while digging, and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if maybe we found a body or something haunted that was hidden for a good reason. I'm an 18 year old guy I started having sightings, which I strongly believe are due to the Fae, and then I started researching. I recently learned about them and read stories, and I've seen many things that seem to add up to them. I don't know if they are attracted to me, or if I can somehow see through the thing they hide behind for a while. The way this works is that usually I see them for a couple of seconds and then they're gone. I don't suffer from any kind of mental condition, and I've never hallucinated. The creatures are not something that I could make up. I'm not that creative. There are some creatures that I've seen many times. I live in an area that is surrounded by forest, and on an autumn day, I was hiking in the woods behind my backyard. On a hill, I saw a little creature wearing a dark cloak with collars that seemed to be made of fallen leaves and its head seemed like the skull of a bird. I don't think it showed itself intentionally because it started running 
and then it was gone. The reason this memory freaks me out is that it was a windless day, and for the few seconds that I saw this, the leaves were moving as it ran away. I saw this creature a second time, at least I think it was the same thing. Out of curiosity, I hiked there again the next day, but this time it was really huge and I felt like it was warning me about its territory or something. So I turned back and I went home and I avoided the area if possible. My second one, which is pretty common, is to see these little people who seem to be like a mix between a human and some kind of rodent. They always walk into my house. They never seem hostile, maybe a little grumpy. I believe that they might be brownies or some other type of house spirit. These are the ones that I would like to talk about and learn more about because I see them so often. I don't know. What do you guys think about it? I'm still not entirely sure what I'm witnessing. My church had a fish fry in the seventh grade. I had decided not to go, but to host friends after. I was playing video games when they walked into my house. I noticed that one of them had a strange all black doll in their hands. Obviously, I inquired, and they told me that they had found a voodoo doll. Later, I would learn that the creepy kid at school had thrown it at them. None of us bought it, so naturally, we started putting our hair in it. After messing around with it to no avail, we left it on the floor and turned on a movie. Later on, another friend joined us, and not seeing the doll, he kicked it clear across the room. We paid it no mind at first, but seconds later my friend starts to cry as blood comes pouring out of his nose. Freaked out, we run out of the basement and try to move on with the night. For the next couple of nights, my friends and I experienced weird events. The main two people who messed with it got the worst. The number one culprit had footsteps walking all around his room, and his door would open during the night. Along with the footsteps and doors, he would hear masculine voices outside of his door. His parents were lesbians, so it wasn't either of them, as they both had fairly feminine and higher-pitched voices. The second culprit was awoken three nights in a row with bloody noses. Personally, I just had very vivid dreams of family members being killed and horrifying images. Not much has happened since, and I don't really talk to those guys anymore as we kind of all went on our separate paths. I still am not entirely sure what we experienced or how it all happened, but I'll never mess with one of those things again. This is an experience I had that I can't really explain. This occurred in the summer of 2010. My stepdad has an old hunting cabin out in Pennsylvania. It's like a 10 minute drive outside of Cook's Forest. It's a small place with a common area and kitchen and a single bedroom with two bunk beds and a queen size bed. My mom, stepdad and I stayed at the cabin for a weekend to get rid of all the trash that other family members had left there and to do any repairs. There are other cabins nearby, but this weekend there was nobody else at the cabins within a half mile. There were also no street lights or even cell service. This is quite literally off the beaten path in the middle of the forest. We came up Friday, worked all day Saturday and left on Sunday. Saturday evening after dinner and a bonfire, everything is pitch black outside. No bugs chirping, dead quiet, which is relatively normal. At least most of the time, it's pretty quiet at night. We decide to head in. My stepdad and I are inside reading while my mom steps out to have a smoke 
and check to make sure that the fire has burned down to a safe level. I'm mid-page down in my book, and I hear my mom yelp pretty loudly. Now, I'm used to hearing her make this yelp. She's done it when she has seen a snake or gets a bug in her hair, so I didn't really think much of it. She comes in limping, though, and she says, Someone threw a rock at me. Immediately, my stepdad grabs his gun and runs outside, hoping to catch whoever did it. I was in shock, not sure of what to think. I'm sitting with my mom while my stepdad makes laps around the cabin. He fired a few warning shots at the backstop we have set up on the back of the property to scare off whoever was around. We never saw anybody run off or even make a noise. When we go up, we always make jokes about Bigfoot now. And to be clear, there were no cabins on the road near us that had people staying at them. So I have no idea who would have been lurking in the woods in a pitch black forest just to mess around with people. They would have had nowhere to go, nowhere to stay, no transportation. It just makes no sense. Did we run into Bigfoot? Maybe. But as of now, I don't know. I keep a photo of my grandma and I on my nightstand. She was the most influential person in my life and she died when I was 12. Once, when my daughter was four, she said, that's your granny, Barbara Jo. I'm named after her. I responded that she was right and I asked her who told her that. She says, she told me when I was in your tummy. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 at Jellystone Park. It's the one right beside the nature trail. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until after we had gotten home. It turns out that my sister, who was eight, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason to find a tall man standing by the bed with his arms crossed and an angry look on his face. At first, we thought the figure was my dad and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see a man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, you don't belong here or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C-82 is something that we reminisce about often. We've been curious if anyone else has experienced anything strange there. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Laurie, Virginia and experienced anything paranormal, we would love to hear your story. My daughter goes through bouts where she's scared of certain rooms in the house. She always has, even though we moved over a year ago. In our old house, when she was about two, we were going through our first experience with these monster fears. Nothing was working, 
So I decided to just start asking her about them. She would say, monster in room. I would say, oh, okay, well, what does it look like? Dead. I would say, dead? Oh my, what is it doing? She replies, it say, help me. I said, well, what does it want help with? And she says, to go to the big light way in the sky. I finally told her to go help it, but that one freaked me out. She also used to tell us in great detail about what I think was a past life. How she was getting married to a man named Jasper Cohen, and how she was in her, quote, marriage dress when a bunch of men came and stabbed her soon-to-be husband in the stomach. These things have kind of kept happening, and needless to say, they're pretty creepy. I was around eight or nine years old, and I was staying with my grandparents. I had this dream one night that my granny had given birth to me, but before my mom was born, a middle child. I told my granny about this dream, and she said, huh, tell me more. In the dream, I was a little man-child. I was born to give them wisdom and to guide them through their lives. I was born to help them, to be their peer. I remember being really confused about this, about being their equals. I found out years later that my grandma had taken a child to term and the child died in childbirth. About two years later, my mom was born. I guess in hindsight, that was a really creepy thing I said to my granny and I'm sure it's the story she tells when people ask her about creepy things a kid in her life has said. Sorry, Granny. Three years ago, I was an exchange student in Ireland. My brother came to visit me so I decided to show him the city I was living in. It was a little bit windy that day, but nothing crazy. After lunch, we were walking and we saw a church. My brother asked me whether I wanted to go inside or not. Because we had nothing important to do that afternoon, I agreed. He was walking in front of me. However, a meter before reaching the door, it opened slowly. I was expecting to see somebody leaving the building, but nothing happened. It was when my brother turned to face me that I understood that something strange had happened. He looked at me with surprise and said, I didn't touch the door. We entered and looked behind us to see if there was some kind of mechanism in case it was an automatic door. We thought it would make sense given that it was a church, but we didn't see anything. It was the classic type of church door, really big and made of wood. It couldn't have been the wind either, because it wasn't strong enough that day, and the door was way too heavy to be pushed by wind. We also checked if there was someone inside, but we were alone. After that, we simply left, still in shock about what had happened. We don't really know how to explain it, without thinking that it's something paranormal. This happened on a cliff overlooking the ocean. My family and I were camping on a site close to the edge, and one day during our stay, we all started hearing this guttural howling noise coming from the cliffs. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. We were curious, so we took the long walk to the cliff to see if we could identify the source. As we got closer, it got louder and louder until it was drowning out any other sound. We could barely hear each other when we were yelling to each other. The sound seemed to be traveling up the cliffs from the beach below, but it was like a mixture between what I would describe as a mechanical sound 
and some giant thing roaring in anguish. We all had inexplicable feelings of dread, and we booked it out of there as fast as we could. The noise did not get quieter as we descended back to our tent. It stayed at its deafening volume. The strangest thing was that no one around us could hear it. We asked and observed people through the day and night to see if they reacted or looked curiously, but nothing. We were the only ones who could hear it, and that was impossible considering how loud this thing was. The volume made the ground feel like it was shaking. It was one of the strangest things that we've all experienced. I don't know if it was some kind of mass delusion or something like that, but it was definitely wild. I was stationed on Okinawa, the most haunted World War II island, for four years. I had a friend who was a single parent. I offered to babysit her son, who was three at the time. We all lived on base, old Camp Foster, which the government has since torn down. A little bit about the base. A lot of Japanese people had family members buried on the base and would build small shrines to commemorate them. Every year, they were allowed on base to visit their family members. So basically, you have a bunch of military housing with random grave sites peppered throughout the base. I was watching her little boy when he came running out to me in the living room to tell me that there was a man in the corner of his bedroom. Obviously, at three years old and with a wild imagination, it was a little hard to grasp, but I followed him into the room anyway. He pointed directly into the corner and described this man in so much detail it gave me chills. He wasn't frightened at all, but it scared the hell out of me. He did this a few more times. He's now 15 years old and of course has no recollection, but I will never forget it. When I was younger, around 18, I was visiting my aunt in Albuquerque. She lived at a little B&B &B that had a big field behind it at the time. The second night I was there, I couldn't sleep. Around midnight, this bizarre howl or scream or cry started up. It was really loud, even inside the house. Her cats seemed to be alerted as well. So I woke my aunt up. She said that she had never heard that in 10 years of living there. Bear in mind, she's an insomniac, so she's often up very late. When the sound kept going, she started toward the door to go see what it was. But I was like, I don't think so. So we stayed in. The sound continued until around sunrise. The owner of the B&B &B was out of town at the time, but when asked, she said that she had never heard a sound like that either. We asked some of her friends who said that they had heard that somebody was going around playing sounds on a loop, trying to lure people out of the house. That's really the only lead I have. I went out into the field the next day and I didn't see anything weird. Maybe it was just someone messing with people, trying to lure them out for some nefarious reason. Or maybe it was a cryptid. Either way, it was pretty creepy. This one time, I was babysitting my cousin. She drew this really creepy picture of her friend Ellie. In this picture, Ellie had a braid wrapped around her neck and into her eyes, and she was pulling me into a closet. I asked her why she drew this, and she said, Ellie thinks you're mean. She told me she wants to hurt you, and she started crying. I mean, heck, I almost cried myself. 
Not much happened after that, but it was pretty terrifying. I was a guest at Abbey Glen Castle in Ireland on October 28th through 30th of 2019. It was a stay for my birthday. We arrived and were overwhelmed with the kindness and hospitality we experienced. We arrived late, so we dropped our bags in our room and headed for dinner in the restaurant with the piano. Our table was adorned with the Ireland and American flags, a special touch for us as your international guest, I suppose. We enjoyed our dinner, and just after dessert we were treated to a piano serenade. As we prepared to leave, if memory serves me correctly, the piano player, dressed in a nice suit, offered to take our picture. As we left the restaurant, we were handed a great picture documenting our trip. We retired to our room, ready to sleep after a long day of travel from Derry up north. That night, we struggled to be made comfortable. Both my partner and I felt a strange presence in the room. Neither of us mentioned it to the other upon awakening. But shortly after breakfast, while shopping, we compared our strange feelings. We were both shocked that the other had felt this presence. Though we had booked the stay for two nights, we politely returned our keys to the front desk and decided to forego our second night and leave to Limerick. Fast forward three years since returning. My partner has displayed the picture in our room. We have looked, passed, and gazed at the picture no less than a hundred times always with fond memories of Ireland. But a few weeks ago, with a normal glance, she saw an image in the picture that clearly looks like a ghost or apparition as the third party to our dinner picture. We were both kind of freaked out by this sighting. Maybe it was there all along. Maybe it's our imagination. Maybe it's real. Who knows? We have shown the picture to numerous confidants and simply asked, what do you see? Without fail, they all see the third party in our couple picture. Something strange happened while I was camping at Gatlin Point in Land Between the Lakes Recreation Area. This past weekend, I was camping with some family and some friends there. This was quite a beautiful spot, right on the water. I had a great day setting up, cooking, and then a good evening, sitting by the fire and relaxing. At about one in the morning, my wife and I went to bed. At four, she woke me up and said that it sounded like somebody had thrown something into the lake. I told her it was probably just a fish jumping in the water. But right about that moment, I heard the splash, and it was not the sound of a fish jumping at all. It sounded like somebody had thrown a concrete block into the water. If you've ever heard a fish jump, you know that sound versus something thrown into the water. A couple of minutes later, there was another splash, but this time it was even closer and louder. A couple of minutes later, another. This is where things get really strange. At the waterline distance away, but right even with the tent, we heard a subdued scream and then the splash again. I opened the tent and shined my flashlight toward the shore and scanned it back and forth, saying nothing. Nothing was there. Then the scream and splash again, farther to the right this time, but not by much then again farther down, and then gone. I got up and drove around. I searched with my light, and I found nothing. I don't really believe in ghosts or anything like that, but I'm having a really hard time with this one. Does anyone know what this might have been?
This happened about six years ago, when I was 14. I'm not sure what reminded me of this experience, but I thought I'd share it. It was a Sunday night, around 7 p.m. or so, and I was at my church's west campus for youth group. At youth group, we would often play hide and seek at the end of the night while we waited for our parents to come pick us up. We always really enjoyed it because the West Campus has a lot of dark rooms in the basement to hide. One room, in particular, was the costume room. The costume room was one of the last in the hallway and had two doors you could enter from. One door was always locked, though, for whatever reason. The doors were about six to eight feet away from each other, so if you picked the locked door, you could get to the unlocked one pretty fast. Something else about the costume room is that it's very cluttered. There are racks upon racks of clothing and different props everywhere. As you can imagine, the room had a lot of places where you could easily hide. On this Sunday, we finished early, so we had about 30 minutes to play hide and seek, which we were all pretty excited about. And so the game began. We all quickly dispersed into the many rooms of the West Campus. As I ran down the hallway, many of the kids picked the closest rooms to hide in, which is also what I normally did. But everybody had beat me to those rooms, and I didn't want to hide with a bunch of other people. So I ran to the end of the hallway, to the costume room. The first door, of course, was locked, so I went to the second one, and I entered the dark room. Once I was inside, I hurried through all the clothing racks and made my way to the back and hid behind some props. As I was hiding, I could hear doors opening and closing and walking around outside in the hall. I was so focused on those sounds that I almost didn't notice the sound of shuffling on the other side of the room. My first thought was that maybe somebody else had gotten here to hide before I did. So I whispered very quietly, Hey, who else is in here? I got no reply. My second thought was that there was probably a mouse or some kind of animal in there that was moving around. That was until some costumes on the rack had fallen down. At this point, my heart is racing. I started to think that somebody was trying to scare me. And frankly, it was working. I whispered again, Please, who's in here? This isn't funny. Again, I got no reply. I worked up some courage and decided to slowly make my way over to the other side of the room to find who was trying to prank me. When I had gotten to the rack where the clothes had fallen from, there was nobody there. I picked the clothes off the floor and hung them back up, because I was just going to hide there now. I didn't want to move again and get caught by the seeker. By this time, I'd been hiding for maybe five to seven minutes at most. Then, suddenly, someone started knocking on the door. When I tell you, I nearly jumped out of my skin. At the same time that the knocking happened, the props I had originally hidden behind tumbled to the floor. I about had a heart attack. The knocking stopped. The sound that took its place was the sound of both door handles being wiggled, followed by, is someone in there? I popped up out of my spot and ran to the door. It was locked. I ran to the other door. It was locked. And the thing about this is that there was only one key to unlock the doors. And the person who had it wasn't there that night. So, how in the world did the unlocked door I had entered through magically become locked? By now I'm screaming and banging on the door with tears rolling down my cheeks. Stop holding the door shut, my youth pastor yelled. I'm not! I'm not holding it! I screamed at the top of my lungs. Then, to put the cherry on top of the entire thing, a whole rack fell over. Like, not just the clothes on it, the whole rack. If I wasn't freaking out yet, I definitely was now. I ran over to check the other door again, and now it was unlocked. So you bet your butt that I ran as fast as I could right past my youth pastor and friends, right up the stairs and into the bathroom. About two minutes later, my friends followed me in there and asked me what had been so funny. I said, funny? They said, yeah, we heard you laughing down there the whole time, and why did you break all those props? They heard laughing coming from the room that I was in, but I didn't hear it, and I definitely wasn't laughing. I told them what happened, but they didn't believe me. 
They thought I had planned this whole story to try to scare them. I don't know what else was in that room with me that night, but by the sound of it, it got a good laugh scaring the crap out of me. My grandfather lived in a very rural area in Nepal, and most of the people were farmers, so was he. Since there was no automated water system, they would have to take turns to switch water to their land, and sometimes this would happen at night. One night, there was a full moon, and even though it was midnight, everything was visible with the naked eye. As usual, he went to the farm to switch the water flow from one section to another. Everything went as normal and he sat down for a quick smoke session. He saw a small baby goat near the farm, which was very strange because there were no houses anywhere near and it's not normal for goats to just roam around by themselves. He thought he would take it to the village and whoever it belonged to could claim it in the morning. He has the goat on his back and his hands are grabbing onto its legs. He was walking up the hill when suddenly he hears a whisper. Such a pretty moon, making the night so beautiful. The goat talked like a human being. He threw the goat to the ground and started running up. He looked back as he was crossing the hill and there was no goat. He ran all the way home and he told us that he smoked the whole packet of cigarettes and didn't sleep all night. I was hanging family photos on our wall. I picked up a black and white framed photo of my father-in-law, who had passed away over 20 years prior. My husband never speaks of him, and I had never met him. My son had never seen a photo of him. As I was placing it on the wall, my three-year-old son says, that's the angel man who lives in our house. I asked him to tell me more, but he looked embarrassed and wouldn't explain further. I've never told my husband or any of his family members. I don't think they would be open to it and would probably think I was a nut. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we live. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here, the so-called Vlak Magic, or Vlaska Magica, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. 
He grew up in the forest in a small and old house, about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night, he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past, of how he used to walk these woods alone, in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow, I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. 
My heart slowly began racing and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I went for a casual night walk in the woods with my friend. We were walking along the path, along the river, and talking. Then we decided to stop for a while and sit on a bench that was right there next to the path facing the forest. The river was flowing behind us. We were sitting there for quite a while, just talking about random things. I suddenly started to hear a soft tinkling, like a small bell ringing, almost like a bicycle bell or a dog's leash, every now and then. I didn't pay much attention to it at first, but it kept getting closer and more frequent. So I told my friend about it. He confirmed that he could hear it too. So I started to listen a bit more closely. I looked in the direction that it was coming from, expecting to see somebody riding a bicycle or walking a dog at any second. That wouldn't be too unusual as we used to go there quite often, and even in the middle of the night, we would come across a few people going on a walk with their dog. The moon was shining brightly, so I could see a silhouette if there was a person coming toward us, but I could only hear the ringing, getting closer and more frequent. Out of nowhere, my gut told me that we should leave, so I told my friend and we started to walk away. I walked a little faster than usual, as I was a bit creeped out already, and after a while of not hearing a thing, it suddenly ringed about two meters away from us. We both just started running. We could hear it ring close behind us a few more times, and then it suddenly stopped. We could hear that we were getting away from it. When we got back to the city, we talked about it, and we realized we both heard it from different sides. I had clearly heard it coming from the left, but he heard it coming from the right. So how did we hear it coming from different directions? Only when it got close to us and we started running, could we hear it coming from the same place. The worst thing about it all is that both of us could hear it. So it couldn't be my imagination. That and I got that weird gut feeling of danger that I've never experienced before or since. About four years ago, we had to live with my mom's friend for a while. The day we came to her house, we were moving things in and I went out to get some of the last things in the car. When I went outside, sitting in the car, clutching the steering wheel, was my mom's friend, staring at me, wearing a red dress with her hair down. I knew it wasn't her because I had just seen her 10 seconds earlier in the house with her hair up in a bun and she was wearing a light pink sweater with white pants. I ran back inside and found my mom and her friend talking in the kitchen. I told them what I had seen. We looked out of the window of the living room where the car could be seen from and nobody was there. None of us left the house for the rest of the night. We finished getting the stuff out of the car the next day. That was not the last paranormal thing that happened to us in that house. A while back, Rando Nautica directed me and some friends of mine to some scary woods. I obviously had a lot of interesting findings over the last few days, but today was definitely significant. Along the same scary woods path that Randonautica had led us to, some friends and I were showing it off to another friend. 
we happened to find a random clearing in the forest, with some path just along the road. I was driving, so I stayed lookout at the car while two of my friends went in with flashlights. It was around 9 p.m. When they went in, everything seemed normal, until they looked up and saw tons of different dolls hanging above in the trees. I heard my first friend scream and run out of there. My second friend started recording and got it on camera before he also ran out. They told me that there were even more dolls that they didn't notice going in, and the ones near the exit of the clearing were even creepier, having large eyes and, for some, disconnected eyes. None of us have any idea what this could be. Something cursed? Some kind of ritual? We don't really know, but it was definitely freaky. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls. They were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift-giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So, of course, some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad, though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old but very pleasant to have around was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then, there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by, so when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. Dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before. I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued though, getting worse over the next several nights until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow, I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening and that I thought it was the boy and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asks him what was wrong, and he points at the door and says, Mama, who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone, 
and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck, whoever bought him. My dad died when I was 11. Every summer, we went to a little town which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad, and I had several dolls myself, but one I loved the most. It resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf facing my bed, pushed into the corner of it. I had it for about three to four years, and I never touched it once. I just admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my dad died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friend at midnight. Both my door and my window were open, but it was quiet outside, no wind, nothing. The doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was nearly two meters high, about six feet. So I turned off the lights, covered myself in a blanket and went to sleep, hoping that I could. I couldn't figure out how it could have fallen from that height and not broken. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground, face down. And I started to think, how could it have fallen? It was protected from any wind, even though there was none. And there were 40 centimeters of empty space in front of it someone would have had to pull it out and drop it. I got up, shaking, and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. The doll was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half. Not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and I never touched it again. I didn't even look at it. I still don't really know what happened. Sometimes I think that it was my dad, but I only think that to comfort myself. As I grow older, it doesn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll that I got from him? I just got this beautiful antique baby doll from Etsy. Something about her really caught my attention and I just had to have her. I do collect antique dolls and trinkets, but I knew since day one that this one was different. I have used two different kinds of EMF meters on her throughout the day and I have received various intelligent responses, both with the EMF and with the spirit box and combined. She doesn't have any batteries of any sort in her that could give off a faulty reading. I have had my phone in a different room with the lights off while conducting multiple tests with the EMF, and I ensured that she wasn't anywhere near walls or light switches. I'm looking for a logical explanation here. If I can't find one, I may just assume that this doll truly does have a paranormal attachment. This happened when I was about nine or 10 years old and I was really into soft stuffed animals. My step grandma was rich and pretty close with my sisters and I and lived close to us. So we would see her and my grandpa quite often and she spoiled us. We went to a store, not a secondhand store or anything, but I don't remember what store it was. There was a shelf of lambs with cute outfits covered in plastic flowers with what I think was actual wool covering them. They were very cute and soft, and I immediately knew that I had to have one. I asked my grandma and she gave it to me. I was delighted and I brought the lamb everywhere I went for a while. After a few days, I sat the lamb on top of a little toy chest at the foot of my bed. 
One morning, I was asleep, but I woke up to the sun streaming in on my face. I looked around my room, and my lamb was pacing around next to my bed. It looked like it didn't have much control over its limbs, so it was kind of stumbling. It circled around, and eventually it was facing me. It looked me in the face, and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up later and the lamb was where I had left it, sitting on the toy chest at the foot of my bed. I was so afraid that I buried the lamb under all of my other stuffed animals inside the toy chest, and I tried my very best to never look at it. A few years later, my grandma died of leukemia, and I felt extra guilty about the lamb, since it was a gift from her. But I told my mom about what happened, and she said I should just get rid of it. I donated the lamb to Goodwill, so hopefully it's not actually possessed, because then I just made it someone else's problem. Probably everyone reading this is convinced that it was just a dream. And you're probably right. But if it was, it was one of the most vivid dreams I have ever had. It took place in my bed, where I was lying down. My messy room had all the same things sitting on the floor, as in real life. And every time I saw the lamb after it happened, I got a weird feeling and just got really uneasy and sick. It could have been a dream, but it was so creepy that it still freaks me out to this day. My kid is six years old and literally says weird things all the time. He has a sleep walking and sleep talking thing going on. The pediatrician says he'll grow out of it. Anywho, he likes to sit up in the dark and say things like, tell those people to get out of here, I'm trying to sleep. Or my personal favorite, mom, who is she? Why is she looking at us? while pointing to the empty wall next to the side of the bed. He also likes to get up and sprint into the dark house in the middle of the night. So that's fun. I have always hated my best friend's grandma's house. My friend has lived there off and on since we were probably five. At one point, she was staying there with her oldest daughter, who would have been about three or four at the time. Her daughter would draw pictures of the man and talk about seeing him in the hallway. The creepiest, though, was one night when a few of us were sitting on the porch one summer night. One of the girls was getting ready to leave, and my friend's daughter said, Laura, you don't have to be scared. The man is in your car right now, but he's not going to hurt you. We couldn't see anything in the car. Instead of leaving, literally all of us went inside to give the man some time to vacate the vehicle. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, 
but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. And I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something. But there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened, and it has always stayed with me. A couple of months ago, my two-year-old son woke up crying around 3 a.m., so I brought him into bed with my wife and I. After laying there for a few minutes, he sat straight up, pointed to the corner of the room, and said, Dada, guy, guy die. My wife and I looked at each other, freaked out, and decided we would just pretend that it never happened. We bought this house from an elderly woman who lived here with her husband, and I do know that he passed away in the house some time ago. A few other strange things have happened, but I'm honestly not sure it's anything to be too worried about. Either way, that was pretty freaky. My son used to tell me about he and his sister and how they died in a basement when they had a different mommy and daddy. He has two sisters, so I would ask him which one, and he would always say that it was a different sister named Claire or Clara. It was hard to tell which one he was saying. He would go into detail about their dad locking them in the basement, how they heard gunshots, and how the fire would come and they couldn't get out. He would talk about it being so hot he couldn't breathe and really smoky, and then he would fall asleep. He was only three or four at the time, and every time he would talk about it, he was so consistent and very matter of fact. He hasn't talked about it in a few years though, and he doesn't remember anything about it when I ask him. Back about 10 or so years ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. 
There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer that they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property. We didn't think much of anything until about 20 minutes later, when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder, and we caught quite a few strange things on that. One day before heading out there, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40 minute drive from the property. So we thought, hey, why don't we go and try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, but after a bit of driving around, we pulled up into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the massive amount of bugs swarming around us. Only a few short seconds later, we heard huge dogs barking, growling, and then saw them running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the general area for a little while longer, just exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we start hearing barking. It was rather startling, and she immediately froze and said that she had never heard barking in the area before. She isn't one to get scared easily, so her uneasiness put me on edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around, throwing rocks, but it didn't seem to do any good. I had never known coyotes to act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they would get any closer, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand, and we booked it into the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in, and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt a sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We neared the car, and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side of the car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we needed to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skinwalker, but neither of us have ever been able to explain it, and I have never been back. So I'll never forget this for as long as I live. It was around December 2004, maybe early 2005, near Burlington, Connecticut. My friend and I were driving around ghost hunting, aka checking out cemeteries and the Green Lady Cemetery at night because we were edgy goth kids. Plus it was a full moon, so why not? Anyway, we got turned around on some of those back roads and ended up in this weird wooded area. It was winter. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, but not much, maybe a couple of inches or so. We're driving down this really crappy paved road with lots of potholes in our old Honda going relatively slow. All of a sudden, a deer crosses the road in front of us. My friend, who was driving, brakes. We were only going about 25 to 30 miles per hour. The deer, no joke, stared past our headlights and right at us. And this deer was huge. I don't know how the heck you measure a deer, but I know horses, and I would say that he was about 15 hands at his withers. 
His antlers were pretty average, nothing too dramatic, but he almost glowed in our headlights. It might have been the moon at that point, but it was still seriously creepy. He stared at us for a solid minute before my friend turned off the headlights. The deer then walked straight at the car, which caused both of us to panic, turn the headlights on and actually drive around the deer, which was still coming at the car. We drive away, now going much faster than 25 to 30 miles an hour, potholes and suspension on the car be damned. I happen to look out the window and no kidding, this deer is pacing us in the woods alongside us. It kept turning its head to look at us. We must have been going at least 40 to 50 miles per hour. We panic, but because of road conditions, we really can't go much faster without crashing or really screwing up the car. Finally, two miles or so down the road, we come up on a brightly lit patch of road with a school and a decent enough intersection that required a stoplight. I see the deer peel off behind our car and run back down the middle of the road. I still don't have any solid theories on what this could have been, but maybe I'm just trying to avoid admitting what I know it was. I visited Dudley Castle in England today with a friend, a very historically significant place and apparently very haunted. The main attraction is the zoo, Dudley's zoological gardens and castle. But one of the enclosures, the castle creatures part, is within a section of the castle itself. There's a room that displays the history of the castle. And as we were reading the information, we both felt sort of uneasy as if somebody was behind us. Note that the zoo was very empty today. My friend jumped away, saying that somebody had touched her arm. We stood for a second and moved on through the exhibition, feeling a little shaken, but in a sort of way excited too. As we nearly approached the bat enclosure, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye and a third shadow appeared behind us as if somebody was striding toward us. We had seen absolutely nobody inside the enclosures and the layout of the building means that the noises often echo throughout the tight halls, but there was nobody there. We quickly ran out of the enclosure, terrified, but still kind of excited. Something else to note is that my mother has experienced some potentially paranormal activity in this building, specifically inside of the bat enclosure. As she went to leave, she backed away and said sorry to someone who was behind her previously, who apparently had disappeared. Both of my parents were adamant that there was somebody there that she nearly ran into and then disappeared the second she turned to apologize. Apparently, these are common experiences. As I said, Dudley Castle is apparently very haunted. So I'm just curious if anybody else has ever had an experience there or if there are any potential explanations, paranormal or otherwise. This is a story that happened to me 18 years ago. When I was seven years old, I lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Both of my parents worked in the mornings and the school year had just ended, so I was home alone. From the kitchen window, I saw something strange in the trees, a creature of sorts. Two things I know for sure. Number one, this wasn't a little kid's hallucination. And number two, I know exactly what it looked like. This creature was about the size of a smart car and sitting about 15 feet up in the tree. It had proportions similar to a gargoyle, both in shape and posture. You know, how gargoyles sit hunched over with their back legs wider 
and their front arms or legs close together or touching, just without the wings. No skin was shown. The creature had short bear-like fur mixed with owl-like feathers. The head was massive, the shape of a bear head and possibly a large beak. The only features I'm not totally clear on are some of the features of the face because I was so fixated on the eyes of this beast. They were huge, like the size of basketballs. And the odd thing was that they were blurry looking, like a dripping oil painting. It was early summer morning, early enough to still be cool out, but late enough to be clearly lit everywhere. I saw the creature out the kitchen window, ran onto the porch, got a better look at it, and I wasn't about to go and check it out just yet. I was still about 50 yards out. I went in to grab my father's binoculars. When I got back to the front porch, the creature was gone, nowhere to be seen. So me, being a brave seven-year-old boy, went out to inspect the area that I'd seen it in. Upon arrival, I saw nothing. No broken branches or markings or anything. The one thing I do remember about the area that was different was that it was dead silent in a forest that's normally bursting with noise. There was not a single thing to be heard. The forest where I used to live was super loud too, with all sorts of animals making sounds at all times of the day and night. But it was dead silent. Super weird. I've never heard of any sort of cryptid that matches what I saw that day, and for 18 years I've been insanely curious. I'm not sure if anybody has anything that could lead me in the right direction, but if you do, I'd be grateful. not exactly sure what this was, but I saw something strange in the woods outside of Homer, Nebraska. There's an old graveyard out here that's infamous for having a witch buried there, and it's kind of a local spot for kids to go and scare themselves. Most of the land out there is flat and used for farming, but this graveyard sits on the edge of a big hill and is surrounded by thick woods all around. Anyway, one night at around midnight, five of my friends and I decided to go out there in the woods and find the grave, because the one in the actual graveyard is fake, and supposedly the real one is out in the forest. So we begin our adventure trekking through the dark night forest. I was in the back because I'm the biggest and strongest. It doesn't take us long to find the real grave, as a couple of the people I was with have been there before. We stick around for a couple of minutes just messing around and trying to scare each other when we all just get this instinctual feeling of dread. I know a lot of stories talk about this, but it's a very real feeling. Like your body is responding to danger before you can even realize what's going on. It's probably worth mentioning that as a kid, I lived in a haunted house and I've been in situations where I've been attacked with a knife and jumped and I've never felt this feeling before. We just decided to get away from that grave. Now this is where us being stupid teenagers almost got us killed. One of the kids I was with says that some people grow substances out here and that he knows where to find some. So even though we all clearly felt something was wrong, we decided, screw it, let's get high. As we started walking back through the woods again, I began to feel like we were being watched, and every now and then I would hear rustling of leaves or just the crackling of undergrowth from behind me. I told my friends we needed to move faster, but they were all saying that I was trying to mess with them. Eventually, as we keep walking, we stumble upon a clearing and we can't really see anything ahead of us. All of a sudden, my friend starts taking off for the other end of the clearing, and we all go after him. All around us, we can hear cattle freaking out. That might sound anticlimactic, 
but you try getting chased by a 1,200 pound bull. So after we get a couple hundred yards away from the cows, something else scares them way worse than us. I mean, I have never heard a sound like that coming from an animal. It was a horrible mix of the cows being scared to death by something and like an unearthly ear-shattering scream. We got the heck out of there in the opposite direction. Now by this time, I realized we were lost in the middle of the woods at 2 a.m. with something stalking us. I finally convinced everyone that we should change our direction so we could get to the road. And about 30 minutes later, we're making progress as someone spots some headlights way out in front of us that we can see on top of the hill we're on. So we start walking down toward the road when I noticed that the sounds behind us had started back up again. I turn to my friend and I tell him to point his iPhone flashlight back behind us. I only saw something for a second, but about 30 yards behind us, I saw a blackish brown figure with yellow eyes lean its head out from behind a tree and then quickly duck back behind. This is what really freaked me out, as animals around here don't sneak around and duck behind trees. I got the best look at it out of my friends, and the head looked kind of like a gaunt German shepherd. There aren't any wolves or bears around here. As far as I know, there are no large predators at all. It was a little bit elevated, but it was still eye level with me. I'm 6'3", and this thing was at least six feet. At this point, I take off. I swear I've never run that fast in my life. We make it to the road in under five minutes, but we realized that we came out on the other side of the woods and we had to walk back the three miles down the road toward our cars. It was honestly the scariest night of my life. And to make things worse, I ended up losing my wallet out there that night. I've been back multiple times, but never at night now. Whatever it was, it was not a human or an animal. Based on other stories I've heard, I think it might have been a skinwalker or a dogman. But your guess is as good as mine. At the age of 18 months, my son would point to things. I totally believe in the paranormal, so I brought out pictures. I pointed to Papa Spiller, my husband's grandpa. I have video of him giving Papa his pacifier and waving by. He also started talking about his other parents, Papa Fisher and Mama Jo. They were murdered, Papa then Mama and then him. After he was shot, he was in my tummy and here we are. He's now seven and doesn't speak much of it anymore, but he would randomly say things like, Papa liked those, or in his sleep, he would casually mention needing help on the farm. In 2001, a couple of days after my mother gave birth to my brother, she brought him home from maternity. I was seven at the time. My brother's cot was in my parents' bedroom, right next to their bed. That first night of my newborn brother being home, my dad was working a night shift, so I went to sleep next to my mother, as I usually did when my dad would be working nights. Around two or three in the morning, my mom and I both wake up at the same time and look at each other, confused as to why we woke up, realizing that my brother was still fast asleep. Or at least wasn't crying or making a noise. We listened for any other noise that might have woken us up, but nothing. Not a minute later, this whooshing loud noise fills the room and we feel a strong breeze or wind. Then we hear the whooshing sound again, this time closer to my baby brother's cot. 
My mom jumps out of bed, freaking out that somehow the window was left open and a bird got in. Now that whooshing sound was exactly like wings flapping, but it was more like massive wings were flapping, not a regular bird. And the gust of wind it created was also massive. Lights go on, my brother is awake now, but was not scared by the noise or the wind. He was just kind of looking around. My mom starts looking for birds when I point out that the window is in fact closed. She still makes me get up and have a look around with her for anything that could explain it. We had a chat afterwards about it and she told me that as soon as she got over the shock, she heard a voice telling her, it's okay, just as she was about to check up on my brother. In the moment, she assumed I was trying to calm her down. But when I denied it, she realized that the voice didn't sound like me at all. I also heard the it's okay, and it sounded genuinely reassuring. It's worth adding that we heard and felt the winged thing come, but we never heard or felt it leave. We stayed up the rest of the night, waiting for something else to happen, but it never did. While the noise and all scared us initially, we both felt relaxed, relieved, content, and happy all at the same time. It's hard to describe the feeling. Mind you, the whole thing happened in like 10 seconds, but that weird feeling stayed with us the rest of the day. When my dad came home and was told the story, he was genuinely worried, and my mom just told him that it's okay. He has nothing to worry about. At his puzzled look that my mom hadn't joined him in being worried, she just said, trust me, I have a good feeling about this. Now, I don't know why she said it like that, but at the same time, I completely understood it. It's been a long time since this happened, but it's still very clear in both mine and my mom's memories. I have tried to look this up through the years, but came up empty. I would love to get an idea of what it was. I live in a super rural area and walk my dog outside in the dark every night. Tonight, I was walking her later than usual and things felt very off. First, we went outside and I walked no more than two feet away from the door and felt something wet under my foot. I checked my shoes and there was a slug in the middle of my shoe. It didn't look like a normal slug, but I don't know what else to call it. I have no clue how it got there, because I know it wasn't there when I put them on. As I'm trying to figure out what the hell is in my shoes, my dog starts freaking out and growling at the house across the street. She does this somewhat commonly because they have dogs that attacked her once, so I didn't think much of it and went inside to get another pair of shoes. I walked back outside and was immediately struck with the feeling that something was wrong. The first time I was out, I heard weird, quiet music, but just thought that the neighbors were playing something. This time, the music was gone, but there was this incessant, high-pitched shriek periodically. My dog and I literally stopped, just stopped, and stood for like a minute, listening. There was this periodic shriek, and then another sound, like a high-pitched bark, Definitely not a fox, I know that sound, and none of the dogs in the area bark like that. This sound would happen every now and again. The worst part was that everything else was dead silent. If you live in the country, you know that it's never silent, not even in the winter. I took a recording on my phone of the noises, but they weren't super loud and it didn't pick them up very well. So I'm feeling a little weird, but I get scared easily, so I try to brush it off and let my dog go to the bathroom. As soon as I stop the recording, my dog starts flipping out, hackles raised, growling, barking, and jumping at something behind us in the yard. She didn't have to tell me twice, so we ran to the door and inside the house. 
I shut the door behind us and immediately felt relief. I felt like I was being chased, trying to get to the door. My dog ran around the house and did a check out of the windows to make sure everything was clear, I guess, and then went to bed. I don't know what happened, but it scared the crap out of me. I'm hoping that I'm just being paranoid. So a couple of my friends and I were staying at my family's cabin for a week in the summer. A lot of weird stuff happened throughout the entire week. The last day we were there was the day of the creepiest and most unexplainable part. One of the first days after my parents left, one of my friends went out for a little run late at night. After about five minutes, he comes sprinting back to the cabin and tells us that he saw a black figure in the woods beside him. We all thought that it was weird, but we didn't really think much of it. The day after, Nothing really happened, except for when we were in the jacuzzi. This was around one to three in the morning. We started talking about the scariest dreams we had ever had, and so we all told each other. But then one of my friends begins telling the rest of us that when he was younger, he used to not only dream, but also see in real life this tall black figure in his room at night, and that it was a really serious thing, because he started getting really emotional about it and started crying as he was telling us. As he's telling us the story, I hear footsteps in the woods below us, but I decided not to tell the rest of them until the next day. Regardless, we were all pretty spooked at this point. The last day, we didn't really have anything planned, so we just hung out at the cabin. When it started getting late, around one to two in the morning, one of my friends told us that his towel kept falling off the hook that he had hung it on. This happened probably around three times. When he hung it up the last time, I saw him do it. He hung it properly, and there was no way that it could have just fallen off by itself. But we went to check on it later, just in case, and it had fallen off. His blanket, which had been folded on the bed the last time we checked, was now spread out on the floor. Cabinets in the bathroom also kept opening by themselves. At around 4 a.m., we all decided that we should probably get some sleep, and so we did. And because we were all scared, two of my friends stayed in my room for the night. Just as I was going to sleep, my friend who was on the floor asked if I could hear the rustling noises coming from the kitchen and living room. I said no, so the three of us slowly walked out through the hallway into the living room. And just as I enter and turn on my phone's flashlight, I felt my stomach drop more than I ever have before. The couch and chair cushions had been flipped upright, like they were standing vertically, and the pelts in the chairs had been thrown onto the floor. Since we were so freaked out, we got everybody out of the cabin, and for some dumb reason we called the cops. Of course, they couldn't do anything. They were probably just thinking that we were a bunch of kids on some strong drugs, but we weren't. It was about 5 a.m. at this point, and we didn't get any sleep that night. I know it doesn't exactly sound scary, but I had never had anything paranormal happen to me before and it was probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. At a house that I used to live in, my room was upstairs and creepy stuff was always happening. One night, my little cousin spent the night with us and wanted to sleep in bed with me. There were knocks and noises, and the next thing I know, she's laughing. I asked her why she was laughing, and she told me, stop tickling my feet. I never touched her feet. I took her downstairs and we camped out on the floor that night. I never told her what was really going on, 
I told her it would just be fun, but there was no way we were staying up there after that. Where do I begin? This had taken place a few years ago. I was with my best friend, and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Lockett Meadow. We had taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself into our tent. It had this weird way of hovering back and forth over my body and my dog, who was curled up, awake, and not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I look over and I see my best friend passed out and his dog. I'm unsure whether or not his dog was awake, but I was clearly the only one between my friend and I that was, and I'm experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what happened, and he replied no and thought that I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear or something, so we looked around our campsite but couldn't find any trace. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it wouldn't have gotten into any of our food. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. I don't know if it was the wind or a deer or a bear, who knows, but this is just one encounter out of the whole camping trip. The next night we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we were in Arizona. Before we settled in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eyes a big rock being thrown near us, making this huge splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything above us, so we run over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top and we see nobody. We yell out a bunch of foul stuff and heard nobody running off or anything like that. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up there, my friend told me that throughout the trip, since we started in Flagstaff, he's had rocks being thrown at him, even before that big ass rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said that was impossible and that we were just trying to connect dots and have it be a cool adventure. Nothing happened that night and going into the next day where we packed up and headed home with nothing of a memory to be justified by. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure what we encountered. I moved to the United States from London with my two boys, three and four years old at the time. Their dad stayed behind. Trying to explain the new situation to my youngest, I said, we don't live in London anymore. This is our new house. We live here now, you, me, and your brother. Yes, he said, and Yazin. Who's Yazin? I asked, the dead girl. He kept referring to Yazin for two to three weeks until I finally said, please tell Yazin she cannot stay with us and needs to go to the light. He just says, okay. And we never heard about her again. At my high school, 
all the seniors went on an annual camping and rafting trip up in Maine. My class only had about 90 kids in it. All the kids got assigned cabins, four to a cabin. The campground was beautiful. It was right on this huge lake at the bottom of a mountain. On the first night that we were there, some of the people who worked there sat around this huge bonfire with us and told us the story of a ghost who haunted the grounds. Apparently, the campground used to belong to a rich family back in the early 1900s, and the daughter of the owner drowned in the river, or something like that, while sneaking around after dark with her lover. They said that if you were in bed and you heard the sound of rushing water, like a river, she was outside waiting to guide you to the river. If you saw her light, you would be entranced and she would walk you to your watery death. The teachers told us that they only told the story to scare the kids from leaving their cabins after bedtime and that it wasn't real. I got paired up with three other girls in my cabin and we stayed up the first night giggling and talking. By the time we finally fell asleep around 3 a.m., I was jolted awake by a loud sound. It sounded like something large splashing in water. The lake was nowhere near the cabins, by the way. You had to walk like 15 minutes to get to the water, and the river was at least three or four miles away. I figured it was a dream or something, so I ignored it. But a few minutes later, it happened again. I looked over and saw that two of the other girls were wide awake, petrified. One of them looked out the small window, but nobody was there. We didn't sleep well that night. None of the other kids heard the noise, except for a group of boys whose cabin was very far from us. They said they heard it at around 1 a.m., right outside their cabin. And when they woke up, there was a bright light shining into their cabin. When they looked out, they could see a light flashing in the dark trees. We all confronted the campground people, but they all said they had nothing to do with it. The teachers did runs every now and then throughout the night to check and make sure the students weren't out of bed or doing things they shouldn't be doing. They said that they didn't see or hear anything. We didn't believe them. And one of the girls in my cabin was so scared that she wanted to go home. She called her mom and everything to come and get her. Keep in mind, this trip cost all of us a lot of money, and we had paid for three days. The teachers tried to calm her down, and the campground people insisted on staying up with us to see if it happened again. She stayed. The next night, the teachers stayed outside our cabin, while the campground people stayed outside the boys' cabin. All of the students were accounted for. One of the teachers continued to walk around and check all the cabins so nobody was out of bed. Nothing happened for a while, so eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up what seemed like minutes later to one of my cabin mates screaming and pointing at the door. I looked over and saw really long, dark, wet hair dangling in front of the window. The teachers came running in and a few minutes later, so did the campground people. The other girl was sobbing and it woke everybody up. We told them what we saw, but the campground people said that nobody else was staying in the campground and the teachers confirmed that everybody was accounted for and nobody had wet hair. Nobody slept that night. And for the last night, we all just camped out in the main hall because we were too afraid to sleep in the cabins. I had forgotten about this story until just now. I've always figured that either the teachers or workers there were playing a sick joke, but I guess I'll never know. One summer, I helped the Boy Scout troop that I was a part of, and we took the troop down to Antietam National Battlefield. 
I received my Eagle Award two years before, but wasn't particularly active afterwards. I liked camping and they needed a few leaders, so I decided to go. A number of other troops had also come down for the weekend, and we had a weekend full of Civil War education, reenactments, and troops pranking other troops. All of the troops were camped along Antietam Creek, on the other side of the Burnsides Bridge Road. That side isn't part of the park. It was pretty easy for anyone to cross the road and walk onto the battlefield to go up to Burnsides Bridge, along the creek, and see the field where the Union soldiers massed and tried to cross the bridge. I grew up outside of Gettysburg, so ghost stories about Antietam didn't bother me at all. There's enough weird tales in Gettysburg that other battlefields really didn't faze me. The second night that we were there, the troops all hit the hay early due to the fact that they were made to march all day by an overzealous reenactor. I took a walk over to the bridge right after dinner and the sun was slowly sinking towards night. It was actually quite beautiful seeing the field and the creek. I walked up to the bridge and started to cross it when I felt an excruciating sharp pain in my chest. I almost doubled over in pain and clenched my chest. I thought maybe I was having a heart attack, but both of my arms were fine and free to move. I put both hands on the part of my chest that hurt and felt another sharp pain right below the top of my right shoulder, in the meaty part above your pecs, underneath your shoulder and just in front of your underarm. That pain came and knocked me down, where I almost cracked my head open on the side of the stone bridge. I laid there, freaking out, and scrambled to my feet and booked it back to camp. I got back to camp and had the other scoutmaster take a look at my chest. I have these two raised red lumps that under the skin you could see were turning into blood blisters. He asked me what I was doing, and I told him that it happened when I was just walking around the battlefield. Not once had I thought about a haunting or anything like that. I called in an evening and turned in. The next morning, after breakfast, the troops were scheduled to meet with a park official at Burnside's Bridge. Our troop and about four other ones stood on the battlefield facing toward the bridge where the park official was detailing the history of the battle. When he talked about the bridge, then I paid more attention. I found out that Confederate sharpshooters took up positions on the other side of the creek and that on the side where we were all at was the Union. The Union soldiers were supposed to take the bridge and were just picked off left and right up on that bridge. Confederates lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 soldiers and the Union lost over 15,000. No Union soldier ever made it past the halfway point of the bridge. At this point, my scoutmaster just looks at me and I'm wondering what the hell happened to me the night before. I'm pretty sure that I felt ghost bullets and to this day, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever had happen to me. When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to my housing estate so we could drink beer and listen to music as loudly as we wanted. This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill where all the surrounding houses were far away enough so that we wouldn't disturb the neighbors. And we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around this time so I lay awake for hours, just thinking. Around 3 a.m., I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation as someone walked on it outside of our tent. I was stunned with terror, 
For one, because this was a private field owned by a farmer who would probably be angry to find us there. But more so because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent where there wasn't before. No approaching steps, nothing. I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to a dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly, listening to this person and his dog walking back and forth outside the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow, which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us every time he passed our tent, and I couldn't see the dog's shadow even though I heard it making increasingly erratic circulations of the tent. This carried on for around five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything. It was more like they were still walking just outside the tent, but with perpetually lighter footing. When I was sure that the sounds had ceased and that there was no threat waiting for me outside, I freaked out at my friends, still as quietly as possible, and said that we had to go because someone knew we were here and we could get in trouble with the owner. I told them everything that had happened, but they didn't believe me, thinking that I had been asleep as well and had dreamt the whole thing. I assured them that I hadn't and that we had to go right away. They tried to get back to sleep, ignoring me because they're lazy as hell and didn't want to pack everything up and go. I gave up too, even though I knew that now I'd never get to sleep. Ten minutes later, the sounds returned in the same way they had gone. The volume gradually increased just outside the tent. It wasn't like anybody approached. It was just louder and louder, and then it was there. I felt the same dread that I had felt before, and whispered one of my friend's names so they could wake up and hear. One person said, shh. They had already heard it and they told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand out of the sleeping bag and up to the zipper. It felt like it took five minutes for me just to reach it, so I was sure not to make a single sound, and I pulled it down so violently I nearly ripped the whole thing in half. There was nobody there. We got out within the space of about five seconds, and there was nobody anywhere. As I said, we were atop a hill in the middle of a field, so we could see if anyone had decided to run, but there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anybody to escape our seeing them, I am absolutely positive that there were footsteps outside our tent that night. This is just added to by the fact that my other friends heard it the second time. To this day, we have no idea what it was. This happened maybe 20 years ago when three friends and I went camping at Kentucky Lake. Well, technically it was Lake Barkley. So we had just settled on a campsite after hiking maybe an hour from where we had parked. It was on a small inlet, maybe 300 yards long and 150 yards to the opposite shore. We had it all to ourselves and we camped near the U bend of the inlet. So we had a limited view of the lake proper. We could see it to the left, but it was mostly blocked by trees on the opposite side of the little bay. It being relatively hot and humid, we were all standing in the water after having set up our tents and things like that. The sun had gone down maybe an hour earlier, so there was still a little bit of light left. I think it was early summer or late spring. So we're standing there shooting the breeze, you know, up to our shoulders in the water. 
It felt great. Suddenly above us, there was a meteor-like fireball that lasted maybe two seconds at most. It appeared to be very close, but there's no way to be certain. We saw it fall behind the opposite spit of land and presumably land in the lake. Immediately afterwards, the entire lake lit up, seemingly from the bottom. Seriously, all the water visible from where we were standing, including our little inlet and the portion of the lake proper, lit up like the entire floor of the lake was made of spotlights. It flashed two or three times and went out. There was no accompanying sound whatsoever. A few seconds went by when one of the guys asks, okay, did anyone else see that? Which was followed by an evening of us all theorizing what it could have been because yes, we had all seen it. To this day, none of us have any idea what it was, but we all saw it. It may not be as weird or terrifying as some stories, but it's easily the strangest thing I've ever encountered. My boyfriend Jason, a 27-year-old male, and I, a 23-year-old female, went on a month-long camping trip to multiple states. Everything had been going really well, until October 9th. We decided to ditch a campground reservation and randomly pitch our tent near Albion Basin, within the Uinta Mountains, Alta, Utah, not far off the Secret Lake Trailhead. We parked our car around 3 p.m. at the Albion Basin campground, closed for the season. Admittedly, it was a little tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear. Upon arrival, we realized the area we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point, we started to express regret as we had a planned campsite in Nafi, Utah that we decided to skip on a whim. After grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear we had to get through the night, as it was going to be about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we trudged on, we both started to feel strange, as if we did not really even know why we were doing this, as if we should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night. But we both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. Fast forward, we made it up to Secret Lake. Totally empty, so nothing like the pictures. Disappointing and eerie. Whatever, we keep hiking up and up in an attempt for seclusion and flat land, when we stumble across a decent space. I see a small cave in the distance and point it out to Jason to deliberate if it's a hell no kind of situation. But after he checked it out, he said it seemed like a small animal crawl space. No biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching, played some cards, bundled up, and decided to go to bed early at about 8.30 p.m. We planned to leave as soon as possible in the morning, maybe 5 a.m. We both dwindled slowly, and after what felt like about 30 minutes, I woke up abruptly at 11.24 p.m. I woke up with a feeling that I have never experienced before. I woke up wide awake, scared but unprovoked, and as if there was no way in hell I was going to fall back asleep, when I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep, so I let him be and just lie there, alert, trying to listen to anything I could hear, which was nothing. Around 12 a.m., Jason woke up stirring, much to my delight as I didn't want to feel alone anymore. I told him I couldn't sleep, but he suggested I just rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby, and say that I was actually very scared. This was very short-lived, as Jason couldn't fall back asleep himself, and we ended up just laying there together trying to sleep, when I ended up blurting out that I was scared. We agreed that it was fine for us to just stick it out through the night, because it was now approaching 2.30 in the morning. We had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so I didn't need to be frightened. Not even five minutes later, 
we're still wide awake and Jason's head perks up so fast, my heart jumped out of my chest. I whispered, what is it? He replied, listen. I kid you not, we distinctly heard the sound of gravel crunching under boots as if somebody was walking up to our tent, stopping, and then walking to my side of the tent. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than 10 seconds, but my mind flashed a million thoughts, and for a millisecond, I was convinced it was a ranger coming to tell us we couldn't camp there. So I called out, hello? My brain was entirely sure that I heard human footsteps. Within two to three seconds of hearing the footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and busted out of the tent for any chance to confront this person, as I knew that he had heard exactly what I had heard. Nothing. There was nothing there. As soon as Jason busted out of the tent and me after him, there was nothing there. We had heard something walk up so clearly, but nothing walk away. Hardly exchanging two words, we packed up our stuff, looking over our shoulders, terrified, feeling watched, and booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way, too scared to turn on our flashlights. This was the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder and find somebody or something following us. When we made it to our car, we locked the doors and started the descent out of the mountains, almost speechless and scared out of our minds. At this point, we reached town at about 3.30 in the morning and slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store. We have obviously since discussed what happened that night and we're both unsure, but we're still haunted by the sound of those footsteps. Our next tale comes to us from Reddit user Throwing Away 1999. The author recounts a horrifying experience from a road trip they went on with their mom. Here's what they wrote. I'll do my best to explain what I saw, but it's difficult to paint an exact picture. I was driving across the country with my mom. We had just entered California from Arizona a little before 11 p.m. It was a rural area, and there were other cars around, but I definitely wouldn't call it traffic. I'm driving, and a bit off the road, on the right side, at ground level, I see something glowing. It's a fluorescent, neon, but dark blue. Very bright, but it didn't light up anything around it. It was just glowing. It was shaped like some kind of energy cell looking thing out of a futuristic movie or video game probably five feet tall and two feet wide, with ribbed sides. I then realized that this thing was moving, and moving very weirdly. It was moving like it was glued to the ground and tracing the slightly hilly terrain, like it was on top of some kind of off-roading vehicle that was magnetically held down to the terrain that it was driving on. After a few seconds, it goes up a little, and then it disappears into the ground. Then we see these two small spotlights pointing from the air down to where it disappeared. They were moving really quickly, like the ones that you see when there's some kind of event in an arena in your city. But the light didn't reach up super far. These spotlights were encased by some kind of light dome and couldn't shine past it. The light was just stopped in its tracks instead of fading out into the sky. The dome was all lit up. It looked like there was fog inside of it, but not exactly fog. I could still see these two spotlights shining around in it, sporadically, because they were shining brighter than the rest of the dome. Keep in mind that I could not see anything else as it was really dark. I couldn't see the ground or the surroundings, I drove past it, speaking with my mom, trying to figure out what the heck we had just seen. All of it looked so extremely unnatural. Literally five seconds of driving later, my mom screams, What's that? I never ended up seeing what she was talking about, 
but she described basically what the internet says are stickmen on the left side of the road. It was the opposite side of the road from where we'd seen the neon light dome thing, and about five seconds of doing about 65 miles per hour as far as distance from the dome. She said they were about 12 feet tall, built like stick figures or on stilts, and she couldn't discern a head. I saw another post somewhere that described how they walked in the same way my mom had said, like lolloping or had kind of a bounce or waddle in their steps. At first, there was only one walking, then another appeared close to it, and they were going toward each other. I punched the gas and got out of there, because screw that. I didn't think quick enough to take a video of the light dome blue thing, but I'm glad I didn't, because for some reason, I feel like we wouldn't have gotten off that easy for having footage like that. I'm not sure why I can't shake the theory that this blue light has to do with the government or something, but I don't know anything. I'll also mention that we saw flashing things in the sky pretty far away, moving too close to each other to be a normal aircraft. I've written that off as Border Patrol drones, but mostly just to put myself at ease. Five years ago, I went on a trip with my church to this place on the outskirts of Pittsburgh. I think it was called New Kensington. I was excited to be with my friends, and I never expected anything out of the ordinary to happen. Before this trip, I was not a believer in ghosts. I thought the idea was cool, but I thought it was unrealistic. We stayed in this old church building that was odd looking and gave off bad vibes from the start. I'm not 100% sure what the name of the church was, but it was torn up and the bathrooms were gross. On the first night we stayed over, my three friends and I got our own room. Usually, you don't get your own room if you're under 18. We were about 15 or 16 at the time, with no leader in the room. So we stayed up late and broke the rules, as most kids would do. And on the first night, we left the window open because it was hot and we saw something weird. There was someone looking up at us from the outside of the parking lot. Keep in mind, this was like 2 a.m. We looked down and began speaking to this thing, but we received no response and it didn't move. So my friends grabbed their iPhones and shined the flashlight, and that's when we discovered something. This thing had no face. I thought I was dreaming. As soon as we flashed the light, it disappeared. We were confused and began talking to people the next day. Apparently, there was a legend of a ghost named Molly. We all thought it was a joke and dismissed it. We concluded that it was all in our heads and that made us feel better. So we forgot about it for a few days. My friends said that they heard weird noises two days later in the morning, but never really described it. I left before they had heard it. And then something happened. We all stayed up late again that night. Our door was sealed and locked when it randomly swung open with force. And my friend, let's call him T, jokingly said, wow, Molly's a real B-word, because he thought the story was a lie and that we were getting messed with by someone. Five seconds later, the door slammed shut and it was loud. We freaked out as it began to open again and we ran out of the room. The hallway lights were on, and we saw nobody else outside. There was literally nobody there who could have done this. We sprinted downstairs and literally ran into this lady. She woke up because she sensed something, and we found out that apparently this lady did exorcisms. We put a Bible underneath our door and did something else that I forgot, which was supposed to keep us safe, which was what she advised. It's a night I'll never forget. And other people saw stuff too, so we didn't feel as alone or crazy. To this day, I'm not 100% sure what we saw or what we were dealing with, but it creeps me out even today.
A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had sort of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually at the top, we found this secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our sight was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking one in front of the other, dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, and they didn't acknowledge my mom or I whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and then right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Neither of them had lights. They were totally barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark and rough terrain not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on edge the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I said I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought they were paranormal, he said, pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. First of all, I don't know if this will be scary to you, but it was for me when it happened, and I still get a little frightened when I remember. I can assure you that this story is 100% true. My story starts when I was 15 years old in 2012. Three of my very best friends and I decided to go camping. Luke, who was 17, Lewis, who was 16, and Gary, who was 15. Since our dads all worked in the military, we had access to some woods that weren't very far away from our homes, three miles at most. Of course, we weren't trained on anything, but since I lived some time in the middle of the Amazon forest, I had confidence that I could handle a not very far from my house night. It was July, which is winter here in Brazil, and it was really cold, like five degrees Celsius kind of cold, and things were pretty much going as well as you would expect from a camp in the woods. We pretty much sat there and chatted until about one in the morning. Then we decided to take shifts in duos to watch out for any animals that could be near us. We were afraid of jaguars, but probably the most that could get near us would be some capybaras that are pretty common in the region. At around 4 a.m., Gary, my duo, was outside the tent calling for me to stay up with him. But as it was so cold, I wanted to stay inside saying that no animal would go near us with the noise we were making. After like five minutes of back and forth between us, we noticed that we couldn't hear any kind of forest noise. No crickets, owls, twigs breaking from passing animals, nothing. And a feeling of uneasiness began to grow between us. Now I know this whole thing of no forest noise and yada yada sounds a little bit cliche, but I swear that this is real. When something weird is about to happen, everything goes quiet. With this feeling that appeared, we stopped arguing and we started to pay attention for what was happening around us. We didn't want to wake up Luke and Lewis because we thought we were just being silly and nothing would happen. Then from the middle of the woods, we hear a scream. It sounded like a woman screaming, but at the same time, it didn't. The scream sounded human, but something was off. It had a kind of animalistic tone to it, a 
It's really hard to explain. I've searched all over the internet, and I can't find any creature that sounded like that. I firmly believe it was not a human screaming. Besides, what would a woman be doing in the woods, alone at night, screaming? With the sound, Luke and Lewis woke up, a little disoriented, while Gary and I jumped out of the tent and grabbed some sticks. That was the only thing we could find that would serve as a weapon. Needless to say, we didn't sleep the rest of the night, and we not so patiently awaited the morning. After what seemed to be hours, but was probably no more than five minutes, the forest resumed its regular noises, and we calmed down a little bit. When the sun rose, we packed our things as fast as we could, and left. When we were getting outside the forest, we told the military that was guarding the woods what we heard, but I'm not really sure if they believed some random teenagers. I'm still friends with those guys that camped with me, and every time I see them, I ask them if they remember this, and they all said that they do, and none of us can imagine what could have been screaming that night. We'll never know if we were in any real danger or not. I'm just glad that we got out of it alive. I've never really had paranormal experiences, but this I can't explain. I'm in college, and about seven other people and I went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year, and it was cold, and everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite, and there were a couple of other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples, and then two college-aged girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp farther away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places, and the energy in this area wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one-person tents, and we formed kind of a cluster in this site, with my tent being in the back, so nobody was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest, because this backpacking site was like a big cleared-off square in the middle of trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m., and I wake up to leaves crunching right behind my tent. I hear footsteps walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like just two legs. I can't make this up. This creature was circling my tent for long periods of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of my tent, and then just stopping. Then it would move on to walking around the rest of our tent cluster. I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth when it was close to my tent, like a light sort of heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this occurred for hours, and it seemed like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shape from my tent, although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow and it didn't move like a flashlight would. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply could not believe that this was an animal. At some point, I fell asleep due to sheer exhaustion, but I heard the heavy footsteps circling until I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it. My leader admitted that she heard the footsteps and noises as well, admitting that it was bizarre and she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said that he also noticed the light that came on, but thought that it was someone else. Not a single person in this group had gotten up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. I've heard about things in the Appalachian region being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. I don't know what this thing was. A lot of people say Bigfoot, but it was not like any animal or person. And no matter what it was, I'll never forget it. Oh. 
I always wanted to try the car life thing after watching so many YouTubers who live in their vans and travel around the country. I lived in Fort Lauderdale for five years, and I thought that I would be stuck there and that was it. Then the pandemic hit, and when I checked my bank account, I was back paid thousands of dollars. Before I knew it, I was packing up all my stuff, and the landlord said I could leave all my furniture and that was fine. Now I'm on the 95 heading north, laughing, actually leaving. I couldn't believe it. I managed to get a hang of the whole car life thing, and I became more comfortable stealth parking in different places and not being detected. I hadn't done any off-grid stuff yet, but I was more comfortable by the time I reached Lake Tahoe. I was hiking, and I asked some guy with his dog if he knew where I could sleep in my car, because Tahoe seemed a little tricky. He said there was a place up in the mountains called Hope Valley. It sounded good, so off I went. Lake Tahoe is already very high in altitude, so this was a few thousand feet higher than that. It was this past July. As I reached the area, I saw a small parking lot that was an entrance to a wildlife nature preserve. It was closed and empty, so that would do. I'm all settled in with my blanket and the sun is setting and the temperature plummets. Before I know it, it's pitch black and visibility is zero. I start to hear wolves howling and at this point, I'm game. This was the experience I wanted. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. I was living what I would normally be watching on YouTube in my apartment. Before the sun went down, I noticed that there were garbage cans that were overfilled, about 15 feet from the car, at the entrance to the preserve. I finally drifted off to sleep, and I was awakened by something at 3 a.m. I couldn't see anything, anywhere, it was so dark. And then I heard heavy footsteps right outside my door. At this point, I am really freaked out. Then something brushes up against the car. I'm scared, and I'm not really sure what to do. I wait for a couple of minutes. Then I open the door, run around the car as fast as I could, and got in the driver's seat. I drove down the mountain and slept at a Motel 6 parking lot like a baby. I never made it through my first and only off-grid car camping adventure, and I won't forget it. The only other time that trip that something creepy happened was in Mount Shasta. I drove halfway up the mountain, parked on the side of the road, and got out and started walking to this trail. I made it about 70 yards, and I heard a low growl. I've never run so hard back to my car in my life. The rest of the trip was just the best hiking I've ever had in Montana. Still, I'll never forget the sound of those footsteps. My family used to go camping with a few group of friends when I was a kid. I remember one Christmas, when I was about five, we were camping out in the bush. There were nine kids in total at our campsite. We were allowed to wander through the bush if we wanted to. The parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp, and we never wandered far. Anyway, out of nowhere, an unfamiliar voice came over the walkies. It was a man's voice. He said he was Santa, and that he was trying to find us to give us our presents, and asked us to look for him. We all ran back to our campsite, excited to tell everybody that we had talked to Santa. The walkie-talkie was taken off of us, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of the trip. At the time, as kids, we were pretty devastated. But now, as an adult, I understand the seriousness and the creepiness of it, and I'm really glad that we didn't go looking for him. One time, my best friend and I were camping by the lake and decided that we wanted to go on a night hike. It was about 30 minutes to sunset and the trail was about eight miles. 
While we were walking, we saw these weird lights in the forest that looked like tail lights, but we knew that there was no tail. The woods were way too thick to drive a car through, so we decided to go a little bit off the trail to find them. They just kept going deeper and deeper into the woods, so we decided to head back, but when we turned around, we didn't recognize where we were, and it was getting dark. So we knew the lake was about southwest, and so we used the sun on the horizon to find our way back to the trail. By the time we got there, we had been walking about 20 minutes, but we were six miles in on the trail. It still blows my mind how we walked off the trail and somehow cleared six miles in that much time. But to make it worse, the entire time we were walking through the woods after, something was following us. We never saw what it was, and to make it a little less spooky, we joked about silly things like maybe it was a puppy or a garden gnome, but in reality we were both freaking out internally. It took us two hours to hike back to our camp, but somehow only 20 minutes to get there in the first place. To this day, I can't explain what happened. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was about seven or eight years old. My father got the idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. My mother thought that it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father, and my mother to all bond. So that's exactly what happened. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was really cold. Well, it was almost December, so I guess it made sense that it was so cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where we would all sleep. We ate dinner, and then we all got set up for bed, and were thinking about what we would do the next day. We got there kind of late, so we couldn't do much on that first day. That night, though, I heard noises outside. It sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing, so I figured it must have just been an animal. I tried to go back to sleep, but then about 15 minutes later I heard it again. I woke my sister up, she was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there, but we weren't quite sure what it was. We decided that it would be best for it to not see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a really hard time sleeping that night, and so did my sister. But when we eventually woke up after somehow falling asleep, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with my dad and she said sure, while my sister stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too, for some reason. He was sweating a lot as well, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father. My father looked at me and said, oh, this is my son, and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, nice to meet you, kid. Name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. And it may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid, so I asked him, You look kind of scared. Are you all right? And he kind of coughed and replied with, Yeah, I'm fine. I uh, just went through shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said this, as though I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing. But he seemed normal after that. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him too, at first. He told my father that he had also rented a cabin with his family and that they were really close to us, so he had decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast, and he stayed, and it was normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. 
My father was inside at the time. A bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick, alone. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick and we talked about what I liked doing and I told him about the video games that I played and stuff like that. Then things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size was, I told him, but I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something like, good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting the band-aid anymore, but I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. When we entered the cabin, he told me to go first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody in there. No family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer, pretending like he hadn't heard me. He locked the door, and then I got kind of scared. He said, I'll be right back with the band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere, and then walked back and told me to have a seat and he would put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg with his other hand and kept rubbing it and said, you're a rather muscular kid, I like that. Obviously, I got kind of scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him nothing, that my leg was feeling so much better. I then thought that my parents must be worried sick about me and that I should hurry back. He insisted that I stayed a little bit longer and that I ate there. I didn't want to, but I was alone, and if I ran, I didn't think I could find my way back to the cabin. The door was locked, so I just agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with. He asked how much I weighed. I guessed and said about 73 pounds. He smiled, nodded, and said, perfect weight. I said, perfect for what? But he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He told me no that things were just getting started and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said it too. Then I heard a big bang come from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, did I effing tell you that you could move? No, stay the F where you are, I have company. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that, it was just my wife. She's really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while he said that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed that there were clothes everywhere and it was really messy. He must have been living out here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked pissed. Get back in there. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she'd been crying a lot. She was sniffing and had red circles under her eyes. She looked at me and then just walked back into the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. He told me that he had kids' clothes that he wanted me to try on, and that was the last straw. I knew I had to get out of that situation, but I didn't know how. I started crying, and then he hugged me, and he said, it'll be okay, little one. Nothing's gonna happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked into the back room, and I thought that that was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take any more chances with Patrick, if that was even his name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. I mean, he lied about having kids, so who knows what else. 
I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still kind of close to his house, close enough to hear the shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife, things along the lines of, where the F did he go? I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. You probably let him leave. I could have sworn I heard him call her a couple of pretty awful names. And then it happened. I stopped in my tracks. I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and I looked in his direction. He was outside and seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him, but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out into the forest and I heard him shouting, Hey kid, it's okay. You can come back now. You don't have to try on the clothes. And I have toys back in my cabin. All you have to do is come back. And then I ran. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes to find somebody in my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to see what he was saying. Then after about an hour of running, I finally saw a cabin, my cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around, looking for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy, that he was really weird and was touching my legs and stuff. That's when my father immediately called the person he had rented the cabin from. The owner said he had nobody staying at that cabin. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger ever again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting them out apologized. The man that had the cabin rentals called the police, and the police went back there and checked the cabin, but there was nobody there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there, though. Nothing really happened after that. They asked us questions and left. They never called us or told us anything about him ever again. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name, and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just really want to know what happened to him and his wife, and how he even got a wife in the first place, if she was his wife, and why they lived back in that cabin. He seemed to have lived there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that I'll never get answered. I'm just really glad it's all over, and I'm really glad I got out of there.